Now we get into reactions with alkynes. The first is adding HX to an alkyne. Here's what I want to show you. When we take an alkyne and we add one equivalent of HCl, that is, we add the alkyne and the HCl in a one-to-one -one ratio, what happens is this. The alkyne, and I've just shown an example alkyne here, uses its pi electrons, pushes them out to attack the hydrogen on the HCl. As those electrons come in to attack that hydrogen, the electrons being shared by the hydrogen and the chlorine are thrust up onto the chlorine, releasing it as free chloride. This hydrogen is now going to attach to one of these two carbons. In this particular case, it doesn't matter which one because the resulting carbocation will be equally stable either way. Thus, we end up with this type of product. The resulting carbocation right here then gets attacked by the chloride, which plugs the hole, forming a bond with that carbon and giving us this product. One thing I need to emphasize is that when this occurs, the final product ends up being Z, which is not shown clearly in this figure, but you're welcome to draw out. Now what in the world happens with an alkyne if we add more than one equivalent of HCl? In other words, if we add an excessive amount of HCl relative to the alkyne itself. Well, what happens is this. The alkyne will naturally, as shown up here, react with the HCl to place a chlorine on one position and leave this carbon-carbon double bond. But naturally, just as would happen with an alkene reacting with HCl, this double bond doesn't stop there if we have an excess of HCl. It will react further to place the second chlorine on the same carbon that the first chlorine is attached to. This same reaction can also be done with HBr. Which brings us to our next reaction, adding X2 or halogen to alkynes. What in the world happens here? What happens is this. If we take an alkyne, and I've shown a generic example here, and we add chlorine or bromine, the chlorine or bromine ends up adding two chlorine atoms on each carbon, leaving a carbon-carbon double bond in between. A second molecule of halogen, Cl2, then does the same thing once again, leaving me this type of molecule. Four chlorines is a tetrachloride. Here's the mechanism for that reaction. We begin with our alkyne that I've drawn here, which is in the presence of our chlorine. Pi electrons are going to come out from the alkyne and attack one of those chlorines, thrusting the electrons being shared by the two of them up onto the second chlorine, releasing it as free chloride. Now you might ask yourself, to which carbon does the chlorine bond? To carbon one or carbon two? Well, in this particular case, it doesn't matter because the resulting carbocation would be equally stable no matter which of the two carbons it bonded to. Thus, we would form an intermediate that in theory might look like this. Now, one thing I want to point out is that this intermediate is not actually a true intermediate because what happens in reality is this chlorine thrusts its electrons down into that carbocation to quench it and forms a three-membered ring like this with a positively charged chlorine. The same thing also happens when this reaction occurs with Br2, bromine. So in reality, this molecule is not a true intermediate, but this carbon-carbon triple goes all the way and directly in virtually one instant to this three-membered ring having the positively charged chlorine at its apex. What occurs next is this. The free chloride generated in the first step now comes in and attacks one of these carbons. Breaking the carbon-chlorine bond, these two electrons go into this chlorine to quench its positive charge and it forms this product. Now, this is the product that you would get and you would stop at if you added this alkyne and Cl2 in a one-to-one -one ratio. If, however, you add an excess amount of Cl2, this reaction will move on. With an excess amount of Cl2, once again, we have Cl2 floating around in solution. Pi electrons come out from this molecule, attack one of the chlorines, thrusting these up onto the second chlorine and forming what we might conceive to be a carbocation intermediate. This chloride that was just generated now comes in, plugs that hole, forms a bond with that carbon, and gives us this product, a tetrachloride. What happens if we add water to alkynes? Well, in order to teach you that, I want to remind you about what happens when we add water to alkenes. I know you've seen this before, but I think the review would be beneficial. When we have an alkene, such as the one shown here, and we add water and a catalytic amount of acid, what ends up happening is we add hydrogen to the carbon 
that has more hydrogen stuck to it, and we add an OH to the internal carbon. Mechanistically, that occurs in this manner. I have pi electrons on this carbon-carbon double bond floating in the presence of catalytic acid. Those pi electrons come out and attack that proton. The proton now has a choice to bond with carbon-1 or carbon-2. Which one does it bond with? Remember, whichever carbon it doesn't bond to ends up getting a positive charge. Thus, the hydrogen ends up attaching to the carbon that has fewer carbons attached to it. That is carbon-2, giving us this intermediate. The reason is because it leaves me with the more stable carbocation at position 1, according to Markovnikov's rule. At this point, water, which is the solvent in this reaction, thrusts its electrons down into that hole, forming a bond with that positively charged carbon and giving me this intermediate. This oxygen is, of course, still in possession of a full octet. It's only positively charged because oxygen doesn't like having three bonds. When a second molecule of water comes in, electrons grab that hydrogen, push these electrons up into that positively charged oxygen to quench its charge, and gives me the final product. It also generates in the process hydronium, h 3 plus, which can serve as the source of H plus in the next catalytic cycle. Thus, we see that the OH always ends up going into the more substituted carbon, that is, the carbon that would give the more stable carbocation intermediate, which in examples like this is the internal carbon, while the hydrogen from the acid ends up going on the external carbon in the carbon-carbon double bond. Now, with that as background, I want to show you what happens when we add water and acid to an alkyne, because you'll see it's very, very similar. In effect, we don't have to learn really a new reaction. We just have to remember the principles of the previous reaction and apply them to a slightly different scenario. Here is an alkyne. Catalytic acid is floating in solution. And what's going to happen? Of course, the pi electrons are going to come out and attack it. Hydrogen has a choice. Does it bond with carbon 1 or carbon 2? Of course, we have to remember that whichever carbon it doesn't bond to ends up with the positive charge. The hydrogen therefore bonds to carbon 2, the carbon that has more hydrogens on it, according to Markovnikov's rule, because doing so leaves me with a positive charge at the more stable secondary carbon. At this point, we can imagine water coming in, thrusting lone pair electrons from the oxygen into that hole to give me this type of intermediate. As we saw with the alkene before, a second molecule of water can now use its electrons to grab that proton, push these electrons into the oxygen to quench that positive charge giving us this product, along with hydronium, to catalyze the next cycle. Now I want to point out something very, very important. This type of product right here is called an enol. The reason is because it has an alcohol and an alkene together in one molecule. We take the word alkene and the word alcohol and squish them together into one word. The word is enol. One thing that you should remember, in fact, as my students, I beg you to remember is that enols like this, where the OH is coming directly off a carbon that is doubly bonded to another carbon, only exist transiently in solution. Why? Well, the reason is because these pi electrons will come out very, very quickly and grab the hydrogen stuck on the OH, forming a bond between this hydrogen and this carbon right here. Upon doing so, these electrons get thrust down here like a door swing on a hinge to form a carbon-oxygen double bond, giving me this product. This product is called a ketone. Thus, in reality, anytime we see a ketone or an enol, these two molecules are actually going back and forth to some extent, but they linger much more prevalently at the ketone position. And the reason is because a carbon-oxygen double bond is much more thermodynamically stable than a carbon-carbon double bond. Thus, we see ketones isomerizing back and forth to enols with the enol form existing just transiently relative to the ketone form. This process of going back and forth is called keto-enol tautomerism. I want you to remember now. If I see an enol, that is an OH stuck to a carbon that's double bonded to another carbon, what I really have is a ketone. That will become extremely important momentarily. Before getting to that, however, I want to tell you something that I sort of lied about at the beginning of the slide. 
the real reaction conditions that are needed in order to push this reaction forward require a little bit more kick than just catalytic acid and water. In fact, if you take an alkyne, a trait with catalytic acid and water, it will not proceed forward with this reaction as effectively as it will under these conditions. What we do is we take our alkyne, we add acid, and the acid we usually choose is H2SO4 with water, and we have to add mercury sulfate as a catalyst. It forms an enol, placing the OH at the more stable internal position. And then this enol instantly tautomerizes to form a ketone. So the real mechanism is a little bit more complex than the one that I showed on the previous slide. However, I showed you this mechanism because I think it's easy to understand if we remember the analogous mechanism with alkenes. Pi electrons come out, hit the proton, Proton goes in the position that gives me the more stable internal carbocation. Water comes in, another water deprotonates, gives me the enol, and then the enol rearranges to form the ketone, according to this thing called ketoenol tautomerism. Any questions? Good. Let's go on. You might wonder at this point, what in the world would happen if I did this reaction with an internal alkyne? That is where both of these carbons are bonded to other carbons instead of being bonded to hydrogen. Well, as you can imagine, these pi electrons will come out here and grab a proton. To which of these two carbons will the proton attach? Barring any unforeseeable factors, it will actually attach in a roughly 50-50 ratio to each of these individual carbons. So we'll have some of these molecules getting the hydrogen attaching to the carbon on the left, and some of them attaching the hydrogen to the carbon on the right. For each of those two isomers, the water will come in to their respective carbocation centers, forming an enol, which will then tautomerize to form ketones. Thus, we end up with a theoretically 50-50 mixture of ketones, with the carbon that was originally to the left in this alkyne being double bonded to an oxygen in solution with the isomer that has the carbon that was originally on the right in this alkyne being double bonded to an oxygen as well. This is what happens when an intern alkyne is reacted under these conditions. By comparison, of course, if we have a terminal alkyne reacted under these conditions as we just saw before, the proton is always going to attach to the terminal carbon in this carbon-carbon triple bond because it will generate the more stable internal carbocation. The oxygen from the water will come in and rearrange to form this product and this product only, which is a ketone that has a methyl group on one side. Thus, it is called a methyl ketone. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. Stay tuned for our next lecture in which I'll go into greater depth discussing the numerous reactions that we have to teach you regarding alkynes. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.